Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's session, the seventh session in the Africa Talk series. We have the distinguished panelists today. Among them is the lead speaker, as well as other panelists. The lead speaker is Professor Dabbo Akonde. The panelists include Ms. Monica Ferratinta, Professor Mohamed Halel, Professor Naz Modazida, and Professor Tom Rees. It's a pleasure to welcome the lead speaker, Professor Dabwa Konde. Professor Dabwa Konde is a professor of public international law at Blavnik School of Government, University of Oxford, a fellow of Exeter College, Oxford, and co-director of the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. Professor Dabwa Konde is the founding editor of the European Journal of International Law, Talk the widely read scholarly blog of the European Journal of International Law. He served on the editorial and advisory boards of several leading international law journals. He has acted as a consultant, an expert, an advisor on international law issues to various United Nations bodies. Professor Dabba Conde is the United Kingdom candidate for the United Nations International Law Commission for the period 2023 to 2027. He has been nominated by the countries of Japan, Nigeria, Kenya, and Slovenia. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Dabo Konde. The title of the paper today is Implications of the Diversity of the Rules on the Use of Force for the Change in the Law. Thank you, Professor Dabo Konde. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the organizers, the Africa Interest Group of the American Society of International Law. And special thanks to the panelists, my co-panelists, who are going to speak um, after me. It's a pleasure to be on the same panel with them. At least at the moment, it's a pleasure. Maybe after they rip into my arguments, it won't be such a pleasure, but I'm grateful to them for, for the opportunity to have this exchange. So the, the talk today is based on an article that um, my co-author and I, Katie Johnston, and I recently published in the latest issue of the European Journal of, of International Law. And it looks at the law relating to the use of force, but what we're really interested in, what we were really interested in in this piece is really the question of whether the law relating to the use of force is capable of adapting to meet new threats and challenges facing the international community. So our focus was not on the substance of the rules, but rather on how they change. And in particular, what we tried to do was to show that we, and by which I mean states and scholars, need to be attentive to the nature of the, to, sorry, we need to be attentive to the diverse nature of the rules in this area when we think about the possibility of the evolution of those rules. So very often it is argued that the rules relating to the use of force have changed, or it's argued that they need to change, but little attention is often paid to the structural conditions within which that body, um, within that body of law that affects the question of whether and how the law in this area can change. So in this talk, I want to do the following things. So first of all, I will note some areas where it has been argued that aspects of the law relating to the use of force have changed as a result of evolving state practice, so where that argument has been made. Second, I will identify a number of obstacles to accepting the argument that changes to customary international law can affect the law on the use of force in the UN Charter. The third thing that I will do, and which we do in the paper, is to argue that despite these obstacles, it is possible for the law relating to the use of force and particularly the law of self-defense to change on the basis of state practice. Fourth, I will argue that unlike the law of self-defense, the prospect of the prohibition of the use of force changing is much more difficult. And this particularly has implications for arguments around humanitarian intervention, whether or not we have a, a rule that permits humanitarian intervention. And then finally, if time permits, I will mention one concrete possibility 
for a change to the use ad bellum that might allow humanitarian intervention without UN Security Council approval and look at whether it is indeed possible even for the prohibition of the use of force to change on the basis of the practice of states. So first of all, let me talk about those areas where evolution of the charter rules on the use of force have either been called for or where it has been argued that they have actually taken place. So one can think of at least four areas where it's been argued that the rules in the UN Charter either ought to be adapted or have been adapted, depending on your point of view, to meet new challenges. So first of all, there are those debates around the permissibility of the use of force by states acting either individually or collectively, but without UN Security Council authorization for the purpose of stopping or preventing a humanitarian catastrophe. So these are the debates about whether there's a rule permitting humanitarian intervention. As we know, the UN Charter does not include such a rule, but a few states, a handful of states now maintain that such a rule exists and scholars continue to debate whether that is in fact the case. So that's the first area. Second area, it may be argued, it has been argued that the rules relating to the use of force by the UN Security Council itself, acting under chapter seven, have changed in the time between the adoption of the UN Charter and now. So the council is now seen to possess the competence to act both with regard to internal situations, but also to prevent or put an end to humanitarian crises. And arguably that the text of the charter did not just, well, arguably the drafters of the charter, let me be more, more precise, did not foresee this rule for the council and probably had their minds mainly on council action in, in interstate conflicts. Third area, uh, is the area where we argue about the legality of the use of force by states in anticipation of an armed attack. So that's the debate about anticipatory or preemptive self-defense. And you know, while Article 51 of the Charter provides that nothing shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense, if an armed attack occurs, we know that some have argued that the victim state does not need to have actually suffered the armed attack before the right to self-defense can be exercised. So anticipatory self-defense is the third area. Fourth area is the area where we have debates about the right of self-defense in response to armed attacks by non-state actors. So again, there's nothing in the text of Article 51 of the UN Charter that specifies that the right of self-defense only exists in relation to an armed attack that comes from a state but as we know, the International Court of Justice in the Nicaragua case has held that the right of self-defense exists in response to armed attacks that are attributable to another state. And on that view, self-defense can only be exercised with respect to an armed attack originating from a non-state actor where the non-state actor was sent by a state or a state had substantial involvement in the acts of that non-state actor. And that view of the ICJ seems to have reflected the state practice at the time. Um, the question is whether that remains the law. So since September 11th, 2001, a number of states have taken the view that self-defense can be exercised in response to attacks by non-state actors, even where that attack by the non-state actor is not attributable to a state. And so, you know, the question is, if that's the case, has the law changed? And if, if, if so, how has that happened? Now, in each of the four areas that I have just outlined, it may be argued that the rules as envisaged in 1945 or as articulated at some later point in time um, have required adaptation to new challenges. So the arguments as to whether these rules have evolved almost always goes straight to analyzing whether state practice today or over time is such that we should consider that a new rule has emerged. Or those arguments are more evaluative. They consider whether the rule should change to reflect a perceived need or to cure a perceived deficiency. Less attention is usually paid to the question of how those rules can change if at all. 
And this question is important, indeed, I would argue critical, because the rules relating to the use of force are embedded in a treaty instrument with a difficult amendment procedure. So Article 108 of the UN Charter provides that amendments will come into force after a vote adopted by a two thirds majority in the General Assembly or at a review conference, and after ratification by two thirds of the membership of the UN, including by all the permanent members of the Security Council. So a very high threshold for amending the treaty text. Now in the Nicaragua case, the International Court of Justice held that the prohibition of the use of force in Article 2.4 and the right of self-defense under Article 51 are also to be found in customary international law. And this might lead one to think, ah, okay, because these are rules of customary international law, well, they will change, they will adapt in the usual way that customary international law evolves over time. And so they will change in accordance or they could change in accordance with evolving state practice. And indeed, in the debates about these four issues I mentioned, it, it's typical to see extensive reference to the state practice over time with the implicit suggestion, and it's usually just implicit, that as the practice evolves, so will the rules. However, when one stands back to think about the structure and the position of the rules in question, so the diverse nature of, of those rules, I think it becomes clear that the issue of how they may change is not that simple. So even if the rules relating to the use of force by states are contained in customary international law, they remain nonetheless treated rules. And they're not just rules in any old treaty, these are rules in the UN Charter, which claims superiority over any other treaty. So what are the structural problems with simply analyzing these changes or possible changes by reference to evolving state practice? Now, to get to the, those problems, I think we need to First of all, acknowledge that state practice may be used in two different ways in order to support an argument that the rules have evolved. So two, the two ways of making the argument that there's a change based on state practice. Number one, practice may be used to underpin an argument that customary international law has changed. Of course, here we need a general state practice, we need a pinot juris, that's one possible argument. Number two, Practice may be used in the interpretation of treaty rules where it establishes the agreement of the parties as to the interpretation of the treaty. So Article 31 through B of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Now I'll bracket for now a debate about whether subsequent practice can be used for modification of a treaty or interpretation only, but my point simply being that it's possible to make an argument that on the basis of state practice, a given interpretation of a treaty has emerged. Now, in three out of the four areas I highlighted uh, area, uh, earlier, three out of those four areas deal with the use of force by states. So as opposed to the use of force by the Security Council. And I think it's fair to say that in those three areas, it's impossible to say that the practice that you know, we see establishes the agreement of the parties as to the interpretation of the treaty. So one can think about the debates around anticipatory self-defense or self-defense in response to attacks by non-state actors. I, I don't think we can make the claim that the Article 31 3B threshold of the Vienna Convention has been met. So usually the claim is that practice has established a new customary rule. I think the claim has to be that it's established a new customary rule or changed customary law. But that then leads to the question of the relationship between customary law changes and the UN Charter. And there are three obstacles to accepting that customary law changes can affect the law and the use of force in the Charter. So first of all, though it is conceivable that a customary rule can take precedence over a treaty, the ordinary presumption is that the treaty rule or that treaty rules prevail over custom. 
unless there's an indication that the parties intend to abandon that treaty provision. So, you know, it's possible that a treaty or a treaty provision has fallen into dissuade, but otherwise we would assume that the treaty rules as between the parties prevails over the custom. The second obstacle to accepting that a customary rule can change the law in this area it derives from Article 103 of the UN Charter. So under Article 103, obligations under the Charter prevail over obligations under other treaties. Now, it's true, this is not a rule that relates directly to the relationship between the Charter and customary law. Instead, it indicates that the parties to the Charter may not enter into a treaty which would derogate from or amend their Charter obligations, except by way of amendment to the Charter itself. But if the parties to the Charter cannot change their Charter obligations expressly by treaty, it would be odd if they can amend the Charter implicitly by custom, which they wouldn't even necessarily all have agreed to. The third obstacle to arguing for changes to the law in this area based just on custom is that the prohibition on the use of force, or at least aspects of the prohibition, are considered to be rules of use covens, peremptory norms of international law from which no derogation is permitted. And one consequence of, of the fact that some aspects of the prohibition are use covens is that they can only be changed by another peremptory norm of international law. So to change those rules, you actually need a norm of use covens to do so. And so taken together, the bar seems to be set very high for the adaptation of rules relating to the use of force. And I think there are good reasons for this. Those rules reflect some of the fundamental features of the post Second World War legal system. And indeed, one might argue that the prohibition of the use of force is central to that system. But having identified all of these obstacles, I think it is possible uh, for the rules in this area to change. The question is how? So first of all, there are occasions when subsequent practice can legitimately be used to interpret the charter under Article 31 3B of the VCLT, as I mentioned, as opposed to forming new custom. So this is arguably what has happened with regard to the UN Collective Security Scheme under Chapter 7. There we have seen that the practice of the Council has been endorsed either implicitly or sometimes even explicitly by the membership as a whole, and that collective practice interprets the Charter in new ways. And so one can think of the interpretation of the concept of threats to the peace to include internal matters or to include humanitarian challenges. So that's opened the door to the council authorizing force for the purposes of protection of civilians. You know, and we're, we're sort of familiar with this practice endorsed by the General Assembly as a whole in the World Summit Outcome document explicitly in 2005, um, where they reference the responsibility to protect doctrine, specifically in relation to actions by the Security Council to protect populations from, from international crimes. So whatever the correct interpretation of Article 39 of the Charter in 1945, one can argue that there is now subsequent practice expressing the agreement of the parties to the Charter, which must be taken into account under the VCLT in interpreting the Charter. Second way in which the law relating to the use of force can change, despite the points that I made earlier, is that changes to customary law are, to use the lawyer's terminology, not irrelevant. We love the double negative, don't we? They're not irrelevant to the law and the use of force. So from what I've said earlier, I think it's difficult to see how changes to the customary, uh, to customary international law can affect the prohibition on the use of force in Article 2.4. In other words, I think it's difficult to see how custom can create new exceptions to the prohibition just on the basis of custom alone. But changes to custom are relevant to the evolution of the right to self-defense under Article 51. So as we know, the text of Article 51 refers to the inherent right of self-defense. And in the Nicaragua case, the ICJ said this is this inherent right or this ref 
reference to an inherent right is a reference to custom international law. And I would argue that this is not a static reference to custom. In other words, it's not a simple reference to custom as it was in 1945, but a dynamic reference to custom. So it's a reference to the customary law of self-defense as it evolves over time. So what Article 51 is saying in short is that despite the prohibition of the use of force, states may act in accordance with their customary right of self-defense while adding some procedural obligations that must also be met, or at least it preserves their customary law right of self-defense. And so that's why, for example, we have regard to the requirements of necessity and proportionality, though these are not to be found in the charter. So what this means is that the customary law of self-defense uh, is only giving content, sorry, the customary law of self-defense in the charter is only given content by the customary law of self-defense. Can I repeat that sentence? It's not very clear what I, I, I said. What I meant is that the law on self-defense in the charter, the charter rule on self-defense, is only given content by the customary international law right of self-defense. And it's that dynamic reference to custom that allows the law of self-defense to adapt and I think make, does make it legitimate for us to debate the implications of the practice around self-defense, for example, in relation to self-defense against non-state actors. So if customary international law allows such uses of force, then so does Article 51. That right is preserved by Article 51. However, I think we must be careful in taking this methodology of assessing custom outside the law of self-defense to other areas of the law relating to the use of force, particularly when one is thinking of somehow adapting or changing the prohibition of the use of force or even the UN collective security scheme. There, I would argue, or we would argue, my co-author and I, Katie and I would argue that we need a different methodology. So not customary evolution, but it would have to be, if you're going to use state practice, it, it would have to be practice that establishes the agreement of the parties as to the interpretation of the charter, so as to also uh, argue that there is some kind of change in the treaty rules. Again, bracketing for now the whole debate about whether you can use subsequent practice for modifications at all. Now, why does this methodology not apply to the prohibition of the use of force? Though the ICJ has said that the charter rules on the use of force are identical to the customary rules on the use of force, both in relation to the prohibition and also in relation to self-defense, it's important to realize that the relationship between custom and treaty is not the same in both. So the charter rules are identical on the prohibition, the charter and the customary rules are identical in relation to self-defense, but that relationship between custom and treaty is not the same. In Article 51, the identity arises because the treaty rules preserve the customary rules of self-defense. But in the case of the prohibition of the use of force, the identity is mere happenstance almost. The identity arises not because Article 2 force is anything about custom, but because custom has come to mirror the treaty. There is no intrinsic link between the two. And so a change in the customary rule would not in and of itself change the treaty prohibition. That prohibition would remain unchanged unless it were to be interpreted differently using the rules of treaty interpretation. And the main significance of the point that any changes to the customary prohibition of the use of force does not change the treaty prohibition, I think is to be seen with regard to arguments around humanitarian intervention. Now, any rule permitting humanitarian intervention would have to create a new exception to the prohibition on the use of force. If we accept that that exception didn't exist at one point, it would have to create a new exception. Recall that this prohibition has three dimensions. That prohibition exists as a rule of custom. It exists as a treaty rule in Article 2.4. And that prohibition, or at least an aspect of it, the prohibition of aggression, is the peremptory norm of international law, use covenants rule. 
And so while there's much debate about the implications of practice regarding the use of force for humanitarian ends, and some states, the UK government most notably, has argued that there's a rule that permits humanitarian intervention. Others have argued that silence, failure to condemn, um, suggests that the law either has changed or is changing. While there's all of that debate, that debate assumes that the creation of an exception can change the treaty prohibition in the first place. And my argument or our argument is that even if there was much more practice than we see now, this would not affect the treaty prohibition to be found in Article 2.4. Now, the argument that the creation of a customary law exception to this prohibition in the Charter, that there, is, that there can be a customary law exception to this prohibition in the Charter, that argument would, I think, have dramatic implications for the primacy of the UN Charter. It would upend Article 103. It would mean, for example, that in the context of, say, the imposition of sanctions by the Security Council, where there have been states that have refused to comply with sanctions for one reason or another, it would mean that there's a possibility of, for example, developing a customary international law exception on the charter obligation on states to comply with sanctions imposed under Chapter 7. It opens the door to changing states' obligations as a result of customary international law. And I would imagine that some of the states that seem to argue that custom can change the UN prohibition on the use of force would take the view that such a customary rule uh, could not do that, for example, in relation to the obligation to comply with sanctions. Now, we also need to think about the implications of the prohibition of aggression being a use Coven's rule. As I've already mentioned, no rule of custom can come into existence if it would come into conflict with a peremptory rule of international law. So we see this both in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, we see this in the International Law Commission's draft conclusions on peremptory norms, so draft conclusion 14, adopted on first reading in 2019. Now, given that a rule permitting humanitarian intervention, or I would argue, I shouldn't say given that because some might object to this, I would argue that a rule permitting humanitarian intervention would not only modify the prohibition of aggression, but it would also be in conflict with it. Then it would seem to permit things, such a rule would seem to permit things that the prohibition of aggression would otherwise prohibit. And it would therefore be difficult to see how a rule of custom international law permitting humanitarian intervention could even come into existence in the first place, given that norms of use covenants can only be changed by other norms of use covenants. And so for a customary rule permitting humanitarian intervention, it would have to be a, a rule of use covenants. Okay, now let me turn to the final part of what I wish to speak about which is the, the possibilities for the emergence of a rule permitting force for humanitarian purposes. So does all of what I have said thus far mean that it is impossible for the law to develop, to permit states to use force for humanitarian purposes without Security Council authorization? I see three possibilities in this regard. So just as a matter of law, I'm good, you know, the, the, the practicability of these possibilities and the, whether the political conditions exist for these possibilities is a different issue. But I think there are three possibilities as a legal matter. One possibility would be to argue that there is a use Kogan's rule that permits humanitarian intervention and which modifies the use Kogan's prohibition of force or the use Kogan's prohibition of aggression. For that to happen, we'd have to give thought to the possibility of a use covenants rule containing a permission rather than one containing a prohibition. But that's one possibility. Second possibility would argue that Article 2.4 is to be interpreted as not prohibiting the use of force for humanitarian purposes. And for all sorts of reasons which I won't go into now, this would not be the ordinary interpretation of that provision that that it would not be the, the ordinary interpretation that one would give to that prohibition using the ordinary rules of interpretation contained in Article 31. 
But if there were to be subsequent practice which establishes the agreement of the parties as to this interpretation, then matters may, may change. Now, the third way of breaking the stranglehold of the Security Council on the use of force for humanitarian purposes is for that force to be authorized by the UN General Assembly under the Uniting for Peace Resolution of 1950. So that's the resolution that provides that if the Security Council, because of a lack of, of unanimity of the permanent members, fails to exercise its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, then the General Assembly can consider the matter and make appropriate recommendations. Um, now, whether the General Assembly does indeed have this power is ultimately to be traced back to the UN Charter and not really to, to the Uniting for Peace Resolution. So Article 11, Paragraph 2 of the Charter provides that the General Assembly may discuss any question relating to the maintenance of international peace and security, and it may make recommendations with regard to any such question to states or to the Security Council or to both. Now, more recent UN practice shows that um, the Security Council practice, the legality and the effect of which have been con confirmed by decisions of the ICJ in the Kosovo and Israeli war position, suggest that matters may be dealt with in parallel by the Security Council and the General Assembly. And so the question that's left is whether an assembly resolution recommending force would be deemed not to be a breach of the prohibition under Article 2.4, in the same way that a council resolution authorizing force would have that effect. That's an interpretation of the charter that is open for UN members to, to take. If there were to be agreement on that principle, that agreement would be an important point to be taken into account in the interpretation of the charter. Now, that way of achieving the end of sort of, if you like, modifying the prohibition would not fall foul of the various structural problems that I have alluded to, alluded to above, various political and practical challenges, of course, but it would affect the suggestion that customary international law can change either the UN Charter or a rule of use covens. So just to, to wrap up and to summarize what I have been saying, um, the thrust of the argument is really not so much about whether particular rules in the UN Charter have changed or have not changed, but really it's a call for us to be much more attentive as to how they change, which has significant implications for how we actually make arguments about the change. And so our argument in this article is that when we immediately dive towards detailed examinations of state practice on this or that uh, topic, we need to actually examine whether or not we can actually base an argument on changes to the law relating to the use of force on evolving state practice. And our argument is that whilst this is possible in some areas of the use ad bellum, there are obstacles to us arguing in, in this way in other areas of, of, the, UN, uh, of the UN Charter and, and the law relating to the use of force. So why don't I bring at least my remarks, initial remarks to a close and um, thank you for listening. EJ, back, back to you. Thank you, Dagmar. Thanks for the committee session. Really interesting. I'm sure there are lots of questions, but we have to wait for the Q&A session to raise the questions. So we'll move on to the panelists. So we've got four panelists at this point. Each panelist will speak for 20 minutes. I'll first of all introduce the panelists reading out the profile. The panelists comment on the article on the presentation. Thereafter, we'll have a Q&A session where the attendees can actually bring up their questions and we can all deliberate on the issues raised. The first panelist to comment on the presentation made so far is Ms. Monica Ferrer Tinka. She's a specialist in public international law. Monica is a barrister at 20 XX Chambers, London, UK. She was featured in the Lawyer 100 2020 as one of the most daring, innovative and creative lawyers in the United Kingdom. Our practice covers the full spectrum of international, public international law, including statehood, 
treat interpretation, state responsibility, immunity, law of the sea, transboundary environmental damage, investment laws, United Nations law, the law of international organizations, diplomatic protection amongst others. It is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Monica Ferratinka. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, DAPO, for delivering a very um, interesting and compelling, I think, article. Um, so let me um, provide some comments. And, and, and I like to uh, you know, uh, state, first of all, that these are all uh, um, reactions um, to um, the different propositions. Um, with the idea to have a bit of debate um, uh, among us. So perhaps the first um, question that uh, arises is, um, and, I, and I think you have placed um, a lot of, um, you've seen all of these from the perspective of state practice and you've posed that there as, as a key element to take into account. And I'm, I'm wondering when I'm looking at a charter, I, I want actually to pose the question of realities, um, uh, and, and perhaps we can pick up the first uh, the first example from the four scenarios that you were suggesting. So the first scenario is um, to uh, to what extent um, you know the Security Council now um, is approaching the um, when assessing. Um, what could constitute a threat to peace and security um, going beyond from what used to be in the past, uh, like focusing on international armed conflicts to now, for example, considering um, in internal armed conflicts as, as such. So I wouldn't say that that first example deals with rules or change of rules. No, rather, I would suggest that that is actually a matter of uh, interpretation of the same, precisely, you know, applying precisely the same powers, you know, identifying a, a situation as a potentially a threat uh, to peace and security. But because now we are faced with a different type of reality. So this is, this is what it comes, it's not about practice, it's about reality. And why am I saying that? I mean, if you look at uh, the recent uh, ICRC um, analysis of, uh, inter of armed conflicts around the world, the ICRC has um, come up with the um, acknowledgement that the majority of armed conflict around the world is really um, internal in nature. So we, we are being at the same, and 20 years ago in a way, um, before, 2000, before uh, 2011, um, we, we had the same scenario. So this is a, a rise of internal armed conflicts, which, I think is, is now a reality that, that the charter is facing. So my first question, I guess, um, I, I wonder whether there has to be distinguished between what we consider are changes of rules or, or alleged ch changes of rules and a, a rather different um, scrutiny and examination, which is about interpretation of the charter itself and what are the limitations and the confines of such interpretation? I mean, this is an interesting question because if you look at, let, let's say the law of the sea and you look at UNCLOS, um, it's interesting how um, no. it's possible to apply UNCLOS, you know, to, to, to si situations and circumstances that um, when the treaty was actually um, 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 negotiated and adopted was never thought you know, it would be applied in, in that context. So this evolutionary um, approach to the interpretation of a treaty, does that, can that be possible at all when, when talking about the charter is the question I, I pose. So, um, and I think this reality um, um, challenging, uh, you know, the charter as it has been, as we have known it, is, is, is also relevant to consider the second scenario uh, that you pose. And, and this is about um, the situation of um, um, anticipation and, you know, if there's an arm attack, how do you, you define an arm attack? 
um, I can I can give you uh, you know a couple of scenarios. Uh, you know, for example, a drone strike um, that goes against uh, an oil tanker, you know, maybe uh, security guards of a certain nationality dying as a consequence of the drone attack. Is this an armed attack? Um, is a deliberate um, targeted attack? Is this an armed attack within the meaning of the United, United uh, the Charter? Uh, and would, that, would this give a, a legitimate right to self-defense? I mean, you've been discussing um, on the one hand, the prohibition of use of force, and then on the other hand, the scope of Article 51, and, and treat, treat them uh, somehow interestingly uh, uh, as two separate, in a way, um, rules that one could uh, approach differently. And, but I'm wondering whether really they are two sides of the same coin. Um, although, you know, uh, the proposition that you made is, is interesting. And basically, if you interpret self-defense in certain ways, you, you, you are going to get into the, um, uh, also the scope of what is, you know, what is really the scope of the prohibition of use of force under the charter. So the example of the drone strike, uh, you know, it is, shows that how the realities, um, you know, the new weapons that uh, we are now uh, seeing, which did not exist, let's say, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, um, are posing the challenges to, to how we actually uh, look at the charter. And this, and a second example in the same direction, uh, kind of going into the third scenario that you are um, discussing, I must say that I consider that perhaps the scenario one and the scenario two uh, fall rather within the, the, the uh, um, I would say, arena of treat interpretation and not really of new rules. Um, whereas the, um, both uh, the third and the fourth scenarios, one about you know, non-state actors and, and fourth, um, whether there is um, any um, rule developed uh, on in humanitarian intervention, um, those two, um, are outside the scope of any um, you know, possibility of street interpretation, but rather really it's about whether those are new rules or not. Um, so let's say the example, if we, if we go to this third scenario, I'll give you one example, say like the assassination, again, a targeted killing, you know, the assassination of, I don't know, uh, for example, uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, you know, which happened not long ago. Uh, a state actor. So can, can we reverse that? And can we say, you know, if, if, you, if, if, a, if someone is an advocate for saying that, um, you know, it is possible actually uh, to exercise the right to self-defense um, when the state had been attacked by non-state actors, if we, if we use uh, the same kind of rationale and we transpose that to the opposite, that is, a state actor that may be that may may have been attacked, let's say by a state sanctioned targeted killing, could then you know that the state say, okay, so since a state actor, let's say a president or you know someone with a prominent role in the state apparatus is being killed, even if it's in a third, not even in the in the territory of its own nationality, but on a third state's territory, uh, does that give the right? to that uh, 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 um, state of nationality to respond, you know? And in that scenario, we would, if one would say yes, we, we would have been, let's say in the situation of Salaman, and let's remember that uh, the US, um, first of all, um, raised uh, at the beginning, you know, that there was an, an issue of a possible imminent attack. And second, that there was an, uh, a need, you know, to, to actually respond because it was necessary to uh, an escalating series of attacks to protect US personnel, to deter Iran from conducting or support, uh, supporting further attacks and to end Iran's um, escalation of, 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 of attacks generally. Now, this is, this is, this is what the US, um, the justification the US provided. And, and what is interesting is that uh, bringing the topic of human rights here, it's interesting that uh, the um, a special rapporteur um, of the UN on, on, on um, uh, the right to life, etc., said that uh, the specific uh, incident was a violation of international law and of US domestic laws and was her position. 
but I, I guess I, I throw these examples because I think these are the real <laughs> scenarios that we are living today and, and, and the charter is confronted with this. Now, I completely agree with your um, very uh, important uh, Although you, you you go through all the cool the sacks and, and and you and you um, explore you know um, the different ways how rules are changed, I think you your uh, conclusion of um, um, page six nine one is quite compelling because there you 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 basically you know um, put the, the finger on the on, on a key I think uh, point which is a no rule of custom can come into existence if it comes into conflict with a peremptory norm of international law. And this is precisely where we are um, when it comes to, um, to the prohibition of use of force. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, uh, I would say, that's why I would consider it difficult, you know, this, um, the possibility of um, a state being party uh, to, the, to the UN Charter to actually say that you know perhaps a norm of custom is being developing and can be interpreted to um, define the content of what is self-defense today under the charter. Uh, why? Because uh, I would consider that self-defense itself is the other side of the coin of the provision uh, because it's a very specific exception, uh, narrowly construed. And the question will be, or the suggestion is that these type of exceptions could be interpreted in, in a more expansive manner and whether the UN Charter as such allows for that. Now, the, the whole topic obviously takes us to other uh, reflections, um, but I'd like to pause uh, and go on to the fourth, uh, on to the fourth uh, scenario that you were considering, which has to do with uh, the, the, whether there is a rule um, of humanitarian intervention. Um, I mean, one cannot but acknowledge that there are members of the Security Council who have been opposed to such a rule, um, China and, and uh, Russia being uh, among those. Um, and what it would be interesting is also to consider when we talk about practice, you know, what practice um, um, are we looking at? Is it uh, the practice of some of the states that have um, the possibility, you know, to, to be able to make this type of interventions? Or is it is it at the practice of of any member of 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 the of the UN Charter? Now, when talking about that, uh, uh, it comes to my mind also the the concrete examples that we have had um, in the past. Uh, we had Kosovo um, and uh, NATO intervening. Um, now this is interesting because it throws into the um, discussion the possible relevance of the practice of regional organs. Um, and here I want to think also uh, at the very interesting examples of Africa itself. I mean, the situation, what happened in Liberia and, and, and Sierra Leone and, and ECOWAS um, intervention there um, and the manner how. So what, 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 can, what can we learn from, from that experience? I mean, in one, in one case, um, the UK was also invited in Liberia um now which is different obviously from a, a type of unilateral type of um, intervention there now this also um may uh, suggest um if we talk about the possibility of humanitarian intervention obviously we have been so far discussed um uh, intervention using force but is it possible to to extend really you know the debate to actually in the context of um, you know, human rights protection, should we rather be also discussing uh, about uh, um, peacekeeping operations and, and other types of operations that may be possible? And going back to the ECOWAS example, I think it's interesting because um, um, ECOWAS was able to, um, uh, under a peacekeeping uh, uh, um, umbrella, you provide mediation uh, and other, um, and, ha and, and having other roles, you know, to pacify and to resolve um, um, a, a situation that was escalating uh, and, and which lasted, you know, for some time back there in, in Africa. So 
So that's an example of Africa. Now talking about uh, regionally, about Latin America, I think it's interesting to know that the OAS uh, charter has a couple of articles that are quite important and, and in a way reflect the customary uh, rule also in, regionally in, in, that Latin America has been following. And there the prohibition of use of force is expressed and, and there is a very strong emphasis on, on non-intervention and the language is non-intervention or of group of states uh, having a right to intervene directly or indirectly for any reason whatsoever. So the language is very um, strong and, and, and goes in a very specific manner to consider any possible scenario. The same for um, Article 21 that, um, that also focuses on the inviolability of territory. And I, th I think here this is a, um, also an important uh, element that we can add to the discussion um, when it comes to um, the scenario three that you have posed. Um, whether, you know, in the case of non-state actors, wh wh whether if there is no um, um, connect connection with the attribution of, of the force of, of the uh, attack, you know, to the actual state in question, um, whether by actually um, using force against those non-state actors in a particular territory uh, is violating the territory of um, uh, of that uh, state that is um, uh, where those uh, non-state actors are being located. So I think that there is a number of issues there. Um, and that is why um, I am not uh, um, persuaded, you know, that when we are discussing here, it's, it's really possible to, to go beyond the limits, you know, of, of treat interpretation for possibly for, for, for the scenarios one and two that you have suggested. I am um, less, um, although it's possible to explore, you know, can you change, can you change rule, rules on, on the third scenario and, and on the fourth scenario? I, I say that the, um, I would agree with you that the, that the threshold is extremely high. And I would agree with you that um, um, one, will, one would need to take a, Unfortunately, uh, the uh, the um, you know the, the, the highest standards that that actually uh, the procedures itself provided by the charter um, um, provides. Uh, there's no other way to actually amend the charter, but but but, but doing that. Now, when you talk about this um, Nicaragua president, I think it's extremely interesting because there the there and I think that is a very important distinction that that you've made. Uh, and that sometimes I think is overlooked. Precisely these, these two sources running alongside, but interestingly in the Nicaragua case, um, obviously they mirror each other. Whereas here um, it is the uh, perhaps um, suggestion by some, by some states that the charter may say these and may be limited, but you know that maybe there may be a customary rule that already is developing and some states asserting that is even you know already established custom but as you said there's no way that you can establish custom if it's going to conflict with parentary rules of, of international law so i would say that uh, also uh, we will be in a scenario where a state can say well now i am acting under customer international law i'm not acting under the charter which is which is an impossible you know i cannot pick and choose when am i going to act under under binding rules of a treaty and um, when am I going to be acting under you know this is customary it's impossible that you actually could possibly develop a rule of customary law in any event to the to the extent that the customary rules got to be universal I mean to a, to a great degree um, accepted by by a, a plurality of states so to be able to actually say there is a customary rule it cannot be done let's say by two states so you know that actually have used these um, uh, in one instance in the past, etc. So, I mean, these are some of the ideas, you know, that that um, uh, the, this article provokes. And I wonder, I mean, perhaps to 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 to, to close uh, uh, my my comments, I, I I wonder whether whether what we are really talking about is 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 only about rules of interpretation uh, rather than you know creating new rules 
and 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 I think that uh, I mean I, I I leave that you know I like to to I like your your reaction Dapo <laughs> on that because um, I I'd say that uh, uh, obviously a the a charter and, and a treaty of that importance uh, being as you put in very well in the article having a constitutional role somehow um, in in the international arena um, um, is a kind of bedrock not just or and, and not just for you know those states that may be more active in, in in the area of the use of force but but I would say for for all nations that are part to the charter there should be a possibility to apply the charter to the new realities that we live but on the other hand um, um, to actually uh, um, uh, argue that uh, rules could be changed um, without using, you know, the, the channels that the charter itself has um, envisaged for such changes, I find that uh, not really possible when we were talking about custom in the way it's, it's, been, it's been talked. And just to finalize, um, on the GA resolution concerning you know, this possibility of um, recommendation, um, well, it's a recommendation, it's not a sanction you know, uh, intervention, which in my, in my view can only be given by the Security Council. In any event, um, uh, it would be hard to argue that a a resolution, a security, sorry, a JA resolution is at all by itself a source of international law uh, could, that could have an effect uh, and, and a modification of, of the charter itself. I mean, I think that obviously all of these are comments and it's op open, uh, but I, I, I would say that the next step on, on all these very important um, um, observations that you've made in the article is to actually engage with what has happened, you know, in in the recent years, um, I'm, I would perhaps I would say in the last twenty years, and what has worked, and, and and what what when it comes to the protection of human rights as well, you know, in which circumstances uh, humanitarian issues have been raised in in the context of interventions, etc. Interventions of different nature, not just on with use of force, but also the example I I gave concerning Africa. Um, and also the role of regional organs. So I, I, I leave it there, and I'd like to have perhaps the opportunity to have a bit of uh, exchange uh, or hear Dapos um, further, um, you know, reactions to my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for the thought-provoking comments. I'm sure Dapos is ready for all this. We'll move on to the next panelist, Professor Mohamed Hello. Professor Mohamed Hello is an international law professor a legal counsel at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Egypt, a member of the African Union Commission on International Law. Mohammed is a visiting associate professor of law at John Harvey Gregory Harvard Law School and Ohio State University. His interests extend to various areas of international law. This includes the use of armed force by state, use at Berlin, international organization for United Nations law the theory and the history of international law, as well as the law of the sea and legal aspects of international security affairs. Professor Mohamed Hello has substantial policy experience in the field of international law through many years of service as a diplomat and as an international civil servant. My pleasure to welcome Professor Mohamed Hello. Thank you, thank you, EJ, very, very much. And thank you, Dapo, for joining us today and for my fellow panelists. Um, so um, I'm going to try to keep my comments very short just to give Dapo an opportunity to respond to the comments and the audience to um, post some of their questions. Um, so I have two specific comments, the first of which is at a conceptual level, and that relates to the relationship between treaties and custom as two separate sources of international law. And my second comment is more specific to the doctrinal content of use ad bellum. So my first comment, um, as I said, relates to the relationship between um, treaties and custom. Um, in the article, um, Dapo and, um, and Katie, I think you correctly note that there's no formal hierarchy between the sources of international law. Custom and treaties stand um, on an equal level as two sources of international law. And one norm 
in one source. So a customary rule of international law cannot nullify or cannot override the validity, it cannot affect the validity of a rule um, that emanates from treaties and vice versa. So both sources of international law stand on an equal level. However, in the article and definitely in your talk today, um, I get the sense that you have created what is a de facto hierarchy for um, the law of treaties and perhaps the UN charter over customary international law. And um, I, I, that was the point that really st struck me in the article because you suggest in various points in the article that to achieve a change in the customary rules of use at Bellum, you have to, uh, there, there are three prerequisites. The first is that you have to have the necessary state practice and opinion yours. And second, you need the acceptance of the international community as a whole because the norms um, of use ad bellum, particularly the prohibition on the use of force is a use Kogan's norm. But then third, you also require a corresponding change to the rules of the charter. And because the vast majority, I'm assuming most of our, um, the, most of the audience have not seen um, the, um, the, the, the actual article. I'm just going to share a screen here so that everybody can see sort of examples of, of what I'm talking about. So you can see in both of these excerpts from Dapo's article that there's a requirement that any change to the customary rules of use ad bellum, there are three prerequisites, as I mentioned. You know, first you need to have state practice and opinion euros, of course, that is widespread and representative and so on and so forth but also you need a corresponding change to the charter. And you see that clearly in the excerpt from page 690 that says it would also need to be shown that the treaty law obligation in article 2.4 had undergone a corresponding change. So that, that sort of, um, that I, I was sort of, that really struck me that part of the article um, that you sort of had created a de facto priority to the law of the charter and the, and the treaty law over um, the customary norms um, of, of use of bellum. And I'm wondering whether, isn't there any potential situation where you could actually have a conflict of norms between the, the treaty law norms and the customary international uh, the, the customary international law norms of use at Belgium. And specifically, I think you've sort of answered this, you sort of half answered that question. So on page 693 of your question, of your, of your article, you say that even if the customary international law prohibition on the use of force does not change, the treaty law could change. So the interpretation of the prohibition on the use of force could change in the sense that the, the, the interpretation of Article 2.4 of the Charter could change, while the customary international law does not change. But in that case, the treaty rule will simply prevail. And I'm just gonna share the, the excerpt here from your um, article so that our audience could see it. Um, you, basically, you basically see it up there where um, you basically say that if there is a conflict between the two, the treaty law will prevail. Um, and and you, you basically invoke the rule of lex specialis to, um, to justify that. And my question to you, Dapo, is this, is it not possible for the reverse process to occur? Is it not possible for the treaty rule to remain stable and for the customary international law norm to develop. And in that case, you could have a situation where the customary international law norm could prevail over the treaty rule by the application of the lex posterior rule, right? So, and, and I think this is, this is really my core question to you. In the, in the case of a conflict between the customary rules and the treaty rules, why is it, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that the treaty norm always has to prevail using the Lex Specialis rule because the, I think the Lex Posterior rule could uh, perhaps provide a, a vehicle for allowing the chart, the, the, a customary norm to, um, uh, 
to, uh, to prevail. And that brings me to my sort of my second comment, which is, which is this. What about the exception, the, so the, the exception to the prohibition on the use of force of intervention by invitation? Because I think it has the same structure. This is, a, this is an exception to the general prohibition that is not listed in the charter. It is not an exception based on self-defense. So the, in, the word inherent in Article 51 here is irrelevant. There's no clear hook or connection to customary international law. So my question to you is this. How is it that we all recognize that intervention by invitation is an exception to the prohibition on the use of force? Of course, you could argue that, well, this is not actually an exception. It's just a ground for precluding wrongfulness under state responsibility. That's one potential response, although I would argue that, no, there, there is actually a third exception in addition to self-defense and collective security, which is intervention by invitation. And my argument would be, that since 1945, intervention by invitation has been acknowledged as a customary international law-based exception to the general prohibition on the use of force, and that that, that exception has become lex posterior, um, you know, and because and, and, that's the only way to essentially recognize um, intervention by invitation as um, um, as, as an exception to the use of force. I think, but, and this is my final comment, and as a matter of practicality, ultimately, the way that these norms, particularly as customary international law, the way that they're going to evolve, most probably will involve debates in the UN General Assembly. They will involve um, you know, expressions of opinions, both on principle and on specific cases, which are probably going to lead um, to a reinterpretation of the scope and content of the general prohibition on the use of force as found in Article um, 2.4. So th those are my two comments, and, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Dapa. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks for that. The next panelist is Professor Naz K. Modazida, the founding director of the Harvard Law School Program on International Law and Armed Conflict. He advises and briefs international humanitarian organizations, United Nations agencies, and governments on issues related to international humanitarian law, human rights, and counter-terrorism regulation relating to humanitarian assistance. For more than a decade, she has carried out legal research and policy work concerning a number of armed conflict situations. Professor Nath K. Modazida, is an author of several publications. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Naz Mondesita. Thank you so much, Ijeoma. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here amongst uh, old friends and really valued colleagues. And thank you so much, Dapo and Katie, for this thought-provoking piece. I'm going to aim just for taking about five minutes because I know we want to leave time for questions and discussions. So I had five thoughts slash questions, uh, and I leave, if any of these are uh, for picking up Dapo, um, I'll leave those with you. The first is, as a, as a good academic, I'll reflect my own scholarly interest in my first question. I, I'd love to hear your sense of the role of silence here. So it, it's, it's in, it shows up in some of your footnotes, and it seems to be kind of creeping around the background of your story. Um, and I'm particularly interested when you talk about the question of how the agreement of all parties could be achieved. What do you make as someone who has thought so deeply about these issues of what we should do in an area as crucial as the law on the use of force about those states that simply do not articulate um, a perspective on this question? Second, um, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder what your thoughts were in researching this paper for the implications of your argument, which I think one of the things I hear you and Katie saying is, please let's be rigorous and please let's be thoughtful and careful as we frame these kinds of arguments. Um, in the country in which I teach public international law in the US, there is a, a somewhat um, infamous lack of uh, appreciation and education in public international law. I think it's it's fair to say that and not surprising. 
and many of the lawyers, as we know, who are practicing this area of law in government and are advising policymakers and decision makers in this area of law lack, perhaps, uh, access to some of the more uh, rigorous aspects of procedure that are in your article. How do we think about the, the sort of mismatch between the arguments that you're making and, frankly, the level of PIL expertise in some areas of powerful states that may be acting on some of the interpretations that you refer to? Third and related, I wonder if you think that some of the points that you make here lay a, a path for smaller states, uh, states that may be deeply concerned about the ways that state practice has been marshaled to argue for a more expansive approach to the use of force of, of a kind of formalism as a space for resistance to what is happening today. So are you, I know that your piece is not about uh, providing a political pathway to any particular state, but do you see here a value for a kind of very formalist approach to the sources and the modes of argumentation of public international law as providing tools for those states who, who are concerned about the direction we are headed today in the law and the use of force? Uh, fourth, I wonder if we ought to be concerned about a certain kind of discourse that I hear a great deal in scholarly discussions regarding the use of force. Um, and I don't mean to accuse you and Katie of this, but I wonder if it's something we all need to think about. Is this manner of talking about two four as though it is an obstacle to be overcome? As though it is this sort of old fashioned rule and we often frame our questions as how does this get changed or how do we make it fit for purpose? or how do we address contemporary challenges? And I wonder if it's important for, for scholars to be mindful that there are many states who may feel that 2-4 is just exactly cut out for those moments in global politics when some states might wish to treat it as an obstacle to be overcome, but when it is exactly meant to be exceptionally difficult to change or modify. Uh, and just my final comment uh, is uh, I really appreciate the way that your piece shows students of public international law, practitioners of public international law, the connections between some of the more perhaps dry or difficult areas of the law and the, the world in which we all live and some of the most vital questions of war and peace hang at least to some extent on the ways that we make these arguments. And, and I, for one, read your piece in a way as a call for legal scholars in particular to be more responsible about the way they structure and form their arguments. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Professor Nance. That was really short and straight to the point. Thanks for that. The next speaker, panelist rather, is Professor Tom Reeves. Professor Tom Reeves, the professor of international law at Ghent University, Belgium. His research covers a variety of fields within the domain of international, public international law, including the law of the use of force, the law of armed conflict, international dispute settlement, state responsibility, immunity, and sanctions law. Professor Reeves is a co rapporteur of the International Association Committee on the Use of Force a member of the International Law Association Study Group on Sanctions. He's an author of several publications. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Tom Reeves. Thank you very much, uh, Joma. And uh, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to take part in this debate and to find myself in such a fine company. It's also a pleasure to have an opportunity to read some of Dapo's work with even greater attention than, than usual. And it's a particular pleasure to take part in a debate on this topic as I am also involved, or I have been involved recently in a procedure which is centered around the question to what extent treaty rules can be uh, interpreted in an evolutive manner or even modified pursuant to state uh, subsequent practice and subsequent agreements. Uh, I'll take perhaps a, bit, a few more minutes than the two previous uh, panelists, but I'll try to keep it brief nonetheless. 
Uh, let me maybe start with a few points uh, on which I certainly agree with, with Dab. I think that the paper uh, indeed correctly draws attention to the fact that the process through which the norms and views of force uh, are interpreted and may change over time, that process is somewhat overlooked in the debate as, as scholars often tend to jump straight in and look at whether practice supports claim X or Y, but this underlying process is, is oftentimes it remains a bit uh, under the radar and, and the paper certainly does, does a great job in drawing attention to that uh, conundrum in a way. Um, I, I would agree with the, the obstacles identified in the paper and perhaps uh, add an additional one, uh, one that's, that's been raised now in the, in the introduction uh, during this session, but which is perhaps more implicit in the written paper itself. Uh, that is the question whether ultimately subsequent practice and subsequent agreements can result in a modification of treaty rules. Now, if you look at the ILC's guiding principles on that topic and produced only recently, uh, I think one of the rules says that there is no general agreement on whether subsequent practice, subsequent agreements can have such a modificatory effect. Uh, my own view would be that such modification is indeed exceptionally possible if only because in international law, the common will of the state's parties will normally prevail over more formal considerations relating to the, uh, for instance, compliance with amendment procedures. But that's perhaps a debate for another day. Um, I would also express my uh, agreement on, on the substantive point in the sense that um, uh, state practice, opinion juris, or a subsequent practice in the application and interpretation of um, the charter rules does not at present provide um, convincing support for the permissibility of uh, humanitarian intervention absent approval from the Security Council. But I will focus rather on the procedural dimension than the substantive uh, issues. Uh, one point, uh, or maybe two points, um, on which I would have a somewhat divergent position are the following. Um, first, the paper draws attention to the peremptory nature of the norms on use of force. And it qualifies this as a additional hurdle that will further complicate the process of interpretation and modification of the norms concerned. I would agree that this is correct as far as modification is concerned, but when it comes to proper interpretation of the rules themselves, I do not believe that this would make a uh, determining factor. What I mean to say is that even peremptory norms are in need of interpretation uh, over time. Uh, and the same inter interpretive tools will apply as for non peremptory norms in that respect. And so um, I, I would have, uh, uh, I think that this brings me to my second point, uh, the importance of drawing a distinction between on one hand interpretation and on the other hand modification, something that was also um, uh, raised by, by the previous panelists. So how to distinguish between the two? It is not an easy exercise. And I would perhaps uh, doubt that there is a um, genuine fundamental difference in that respect between Article 51 and Article 2.4. And the point that was made by DAPO is that the inclusion of the word inherent in Article 51 implies that the process of interpretation, the process of change of that norm would be different than if we were to look at uh, Article 2.4. Um, it is questionable whether indeed that approach is justified by looking at, for instance, the preparatory works of the Charter, whether indeed the mere inclusion of the word inherent justifies um, uh, applying the process of change differently than to the other um, charter rules on use of force. So the distinction between interpretation and modification is a different one. Um, I, in my view, the, the, the question must be tackled in a similar fashion for the various norms on use of force found in the charter. Uh, and let me give one example. When it comes to Article 51, and some of the ongoing debates have been uh, raised already, to what extent do some of the um, controversial claims amount to claims involving interpretation of rather modification? I would say that uh, an attempt to broaden self-defense to encompass attacks by non-state actors is more akin to an exercise in interpretation, since at least the ordinary, uh, the text of the provision itself leaves room for such interpretation. 
whether or not it's the correct one, I leave that aside. By contrast, if, if we look at the claim that an armed attack is not required for purposes of exercising self-defense, but that a mere threat would qualify as such, I think we are moving more towards an actual modification um, than in, the pre in respect of the previous claim. Yeah. So distinguishing interpretation from modification is not an easy exercise. It may not be so much a binary a question, but rather perhaps an ex a continuum um, that uh, uh, that we must uh, take into account. Uh, but the mere inclusion, as I mentioned before, of the word inherent, in my view, is not a determining factor that changes the process altogether. Now, um, that brings me to what I will call the Akande paradox. Uh, uh, you will be familiar, all of you will be familiar with the Baxter paradox. Uh, this time we're discussing the Akande paradox, which suggests that if a norm is simultaneously part of treaty law, and customary international law that there is this at least hypothetical possibility that the two will develop in opposite directions or different directions. Um, is that poss possibility indeed uh, a genuine one or not? Um, I would give maybe a few observations why in my view um, the paradox must be nuanced, why perhaps the uh, dichotomy is not as fundamental as the paper suggests. Three points, if I may. Firstly, um, I think that when states express their legal views on questions of self-defense or on the scope of the prohibition on use of force, they simultaneously express their legal conviction as a matter of treaty law and as a matter of customary international law. And the legal conviction of the state cannot go in separate directions uh, for purposes of interpreting treaty and custom. So the two necessarily develop in the same direction. That would be a first point. Secondly, um, for both when it comes to interpreting treaty by means of subsequent practice and when it comes to um, identifying custom on the basis of state practice, in both respects, state silence or acquiescence is relevant, it's a relevant factor. Uh, the normative value to be attached to is a different um, question, but at least as a matter of principle, I do believe that state silence can also be a relevant factor uh, when utilizing subsequent practice for purposes of interpreting treaty norms. And one example is given in the paper um, of, of Dalpa and Katie, uh, and that relates to Article 27.3 of the Charter. And the decision-making process of the Security Council, we know that a number of states have uh, engaged in a certain practice, namely the members of the Security Council, whereas the non-members of the Council have, to a certain extent, acquiesced in the process whereby Article 27.3 is interpreted um, against the ordinary, ordinary meaning of the term, of the text. So silence is also a relevant factor uh, for both purposes when it comes to interpreting treaty, but also when it comes to identifying custom. And the third point that may be a relevant factor to reduce this or to, to mitigate the paradox identified in the paper concerns the fact that subsequent practice is not only a primary tool of interpretation of Article 31 of the Convention Law of Treaties, but can also be utilized as a subsidiary means under Article 32 even when the subsequent practice is only the practice of a number of state parties, rather than an expression of the common will of all of the state parties um, to the treaty. So these are some of the mitigating elements I would uh, uh, raise. Um, and that leads me to my final point that in spite of the relevant point being made in this paper and the a need to address at the procedural mechanisms underpinning the change and in interpretation of the norms on use of force. It is still primarily a question of generality, primarily a question of ascertaining that the large majority of states supports a certain interpretation of the norms on use of force. And here again, I would agree with previous panelists uh, in the sense that the threshold that the bar must be set high, amongst others in light of the peremptory nature of the norms, also in light of the fact that uh, this, these are norms that are of relevance to all states 
to all members of the international community, rather than to a select club of specially affected states. And the final, final point then is that um, I would express uh, my regret that in scholarship, but also in practice, that we continue to focus rather narrowly on the practice of a small set of primarily Western states. And that is something that scholars and states should at least uh, strive to overcome, and we should all strive to broaden our horizon and to also look at the practice and the legal convictions of other states from other regions. And in that respect, I would certainly applaud the recent initiative by Nas um, Morizadeh um, in organizing or co organizing the last year's ARIA formula meeting on the scope of self defense. And I would also uh, think that it is vital that, since this is an event of the Africa Interest Group, that countries from the African region also participate more actively in this exercise, express their legal convictions, and possibly, possibly there is a role in this field for the African Union. I realize that uh, another panelist and co-host of this event is also a member of the African Union's International Law Commission. I re we all know that for some countries it is rather demanding to expect that they invest the development of human resources, the intellectual capital in this exercise and participating in the, uh, the, the process that uh, is custom, uh, but maybe a pooling of resources uh, through regional organizations can facilitate in this endeavor. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. We'll go straight to the comments, specific comments to that one, please, from the panelists. Any specific comments or questions to that one? So obviously, we've thrown up so many issues, which of course is head. But if we have specific questions, I suggest we bring up the questions now for that one to address. So, EJ, can I just check? Are you asking the audience if they have specific? So not, not the audience, the panelists now. The panelists, they're much later. Oh, okay. So, for now, the panelists, if you have any question, any specific question for that, please could you wait it? Thereafter, we'll move on to the audience, to the attendees. So, EJ, I, I feel that we're, we are running out of time. So, maybe. Yeah, we actually. I invite Dapo to reflect on maybe the comments from the panelists, especially that I don't see any um, okay. questions from the, from the audience. Oh, the okay, the yeah, right. Yeah, Dapo, please, could you respond to the comments made so far? Okay, thank you. I'll respond to the comments made, and I just see one in the QA, which I haven't read yet. It's from it's from Adil Hack, and I will read that and try and respond to that. So, first of all, thank you to all of you for such a rich set of of comments, really thought provoking. I don't know if I can deal with absolutely everything, but I will try my best to, um, to do as much as I can. So if I start with Monica and just take this question of whether we can distinguish changes in the rules or modifications from interpretation. I think this is something that Monica referred to a couple of times and Tom also also refer to this question of can we distinguish between modification and, and interpretation and, and I detect a hint of uh, disagreement even between the two of them uh, on this question. Um, so my, my own view on this is that while it might be I'm not, I, I'm not sure I have no view actually on whether or not it's possible to do this in theory but I think certainly in practice, it is very, very difficult to, to distinguish. If we are interpreting on the basis of subsequent agreement, sorry, subsequent practice of the parties, which establishes their agreement. Now, it's an interpretation. It may well be that we come to an interpretation today, which is different from the interpretation that we would have come to yesterday, but it's nonetheless an interpretation under the Vienna Convention. Now, the question is, is this a modification? To answer that question suggests that there was some uh, sort of authoritative decision maker who made the decision yesterday as to what that interpretation was. So I actually tend to, you know, I take a very similar view to the view that Tom takes, which is that, you know, the parties as a collective, all of them 
are sort of masters of the treaty that they have. And if they have come to a common consensus as to what the treaty is, then in general, I'm not saying all the time, in general, that interpretation tends to be the correct interpretation, even if what it means is that it's a different one from the one that we would have reached yesterday. But I'm not sure whether I'd classify that as modification or not, but it's still a, an interpretation. Um, Mohammed asks sort of two, two questions. The one, the first one is about our view of the relationship between treaties and custom. And essentially, Mohammed is suggesting that we say on the one hand that there's no formal hierarchy but that on the other hand, we have actually created, in effect, a hierarchy, placing treaties at, at, the, you know, at the top of that hierarchy. And I think that's a, that's a, fair, a fair comment to make. I mean, essentially, the point that we're making is that a, 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 there are two ways of sort of looking at this. So the first point is to make is to say that actually leaving aside the whole question of hierarchy, once you have these two rules, these two rules will be binding on you. Um, and the fact that you've changed one of those rules doesn't mean that you've changed your obligations under the other. So even if you successfully change the rule relating to custom international law, that does not actually relieve you of your obligations under the treaty. And so for that, we don't actually need to get to the question of hierarchy. These are just two separate norms. And those norms will continue to be binding on you and your treaty obligations will remain, um, is the point that we're making, unless there is some process by which those treaty obligations cease to be binding. That's possible that the treaty obligations will cease to be binding on you, but typically that will happen through some kind of dissuade of those obligations. And I don't think anyone suggests that that's the case in relation to the relevant provisions of the charter. So we never actually get to that position where we say the treaty obligation is now no longer applicable. So our main message is you need to deal with the treaty. Whatever happens with custom, you still need to deal with the argument as to what your treaty obligations are. Mohammed's second question was about whether there hasn't actually, in fact, been an exception to the prohibition on the use of force based on intervention by invitation. And of course, if that's correct, then that would suggest that what we're arguing is difficult, is maybe not as difficult as we say it is, because we're saying, look, you can't create an exception to this prohibition by custom. Mohammed is saying, well, maybe there has been one. And what about this one, in intervention by invitation? So my response to that would be to say that, at least in my view, this is not an exception to, to the prohibition, but I would say that this is something that's not even covered in the first place by the prohibition. And so how would I argue that it's not covered in the first place? So basically the argument would be that when a state uses force on the territory of another state with the consent of the government of that other state, this is not even sort of prima facie prohibited by Article 2.4, because it's not a use of force that's against the territorial integrity or political independence of that state. So it's not even covered in the first place by the prohibition, and so we don't need an exception. That would be my, my argument to, to that. To take some of Naz's uh, questions, and thank you so much for, for those. So you ask, what's the role of silence? And actually, Tom answered that question for me, and I will just agree with what Tom says, which is to say that I, I agree with you that silence has a role to play, both with, with regard to um, both with regard to custom international law and with regard to subsequent practice in regard to the interpretation of, of treaties. In other words, when we call for practice in both areas, we don't always need for every state involved to have engaged in the practice. Silence can count. Of course, the question is, how much practice and how do you weigh that against the silence that you might see, right? So where is, is the balance there? And before you know, getting into the, the, the legal question, I joined the call, your call, Tom's call, for first of all, for us to analyze actually the, you know, well, first of all, the call for states generally, I think that's the first thing actually for more states to be engaged in making their, their practice known. 
But I suppose fundamentally for me, though, the question is to say, even before we get to the whole question of what is the practice, let's even analyze whether practice is relevant. That for me is the fundamental point. Is practice even relevant at all? Whether it's practice in the active practice category or whether it's practice in the silence category. And that takes me to your next question about what are the implications of our, of our argument? Because that's the implication that we shouldn't always just turn straight to, let's be looking for the practice. And the implication is essentially to say, and this gets to one of the points that you're making, I think it was your fourth question. The implication is to say, actually, um, you know, all these arguments that are based on practice, which in most cases, most cases are turning towards an analysis of whether there's a customary law change are really undermining the value of the UN Charter. That's really the point that we're making. It's undermining the role of the UN Charter and it is implicitly making an argument that the UN Charter can be changed by customary international law. And what we're trying to say is there might be circumstances where the Charter itself allows for that. The Charter itself is making reference to custom, but where the Charter itself does not do that, the Charter actually has a role which is superior, and you can't get around that simply by making reference to rules of customary international law. Does the argument lay a path to smaller states to use formalism as a way of resistance? I think it does in some cases. It may be smaller states, it may be other states. I mean, we didn't write it as necessarily, a, you know, for that purpose, but I think it does in some cases. You know, it says, look, let's stand back actually. Before we start getting into how much practice and how much, let's actually look at the primacy of the charter, which is important, you know? And so in that sense, I agree with you that actually it's not, you know, it's not that Article 2.4 is something to be overcome. It's not an obstacle. There's a good reason. And I think we say this in, in the article, there's a good reason actually why Article 2.4 is difficult to change. There's a good reason why there are these structural obstacles. These are not bugs. These are features of the system. It's hard to change. There's a reason for it, and there's a good reason for it. So, so, so going to Tom's point, I think this is what, um, and his points of, of disagreement in particular. Um, so I think to, to pick up on one of the points that he made, what he calls the, uh, what he calls the, the, the Akande paradox, which is which is kind of Akande Johnston paradox, probably is if we're going to give it a name. Um, so the possibility that that custom and treaty will develop in different directions. I, I detect even from Tom that he accepts that in theory this is possible, but he's looking for ways to mitigate that. I detect that that's what you're saying, but I may be wrong. But yes, I think I would stand by that. That that is indeed possible that they will develop in different directions. And I think this goes with the point I was making in response to uh, Mohammed's question. So I take your three points and I agree with your three points in response. And maybe I agree with your, the way you phrase it, that these, are, these mitigate the possibility that they will develop in different directions. But ultimately, of course, they don't eliminate that possibility. Why do they not eliminate that possibility? So I agree that when states express their views on the use ad bellum, they're expressing their views both under custom and treaty. But the, the, the fundamental point is that, that the threshold of change is different. And that's what we can't get around. The threshold of change, for, again, I'm calling this change. I think Monica might disagree and say change and interpretation are different. But the threshold for a subsequent interpretation, sorry, subsequent practice, which leads to a different interpretation, is that it establishes the agreement of the parties. Whereas the threshold for custom international law is that it is a general practice. And those two things are actually very different. And that's the fundamental issue. And that's precisely why many refer to custom, because they know that they can't meet the threshold for subsequent practice under the Vienna Convention. Now, of course, we've talked about the silences. Okay, let's even put all the silences in the practice column. We see actually in many of these cases, if not all of these cases, objections. 
And of course, it's possible for there to be an objection and for custom to still develop. That is in principle possible, okay? But it's not possible for there to be at least the number of objections we see and for us to say that there's a subsequent practice which establishes the agreement of the parties. So that's where the divergence occurs. You can meet the custom threshold, but in, in none of these cases is it possible, I think, for us to say that the threshold for subsequent practice which establishes the agreement of the parties has been met. So I think that's the fundamental divide. Even if we got to a, a majority, a large majority, we wouldn't get to the necessary threshold. Just the last thing um, in response to, to Tom, um, uh, um, as I said, well, I, I think you, sorry, I had one other question which has now gone out, out of my head in relation to Tom. Uh, oh yes, Tom doubted that there's a difference between Article 2.4 and Article 51, uh, because we say that there's a difference based on the, the use of the word inherent. Now, just to remind people what the, the argument is, the argument is that in both cases, you have identity of treaty and custom. That's the argument. In both cases, treaty and custom is the same. But we argue that that identity in substance is the same, but the way in which that identity has been achieved is different and that that matters. So our argument is that the identity is, in, is built into Article 51. Article 51 essentially preserves a customary right. And as custom changes, so that right will change too. Whereas we argue that that identity is not built into Article 2.4. It's almost happenstance that that has occurred. And I think it was, I mean, one can argue about whether that was the customary law in, in, in 1945. I would argue no. What, was there a prohibition of the use of force in the way in which we now see it in 1945? I'm not sure that I would say there was, but that's what I mean by its happenstance. They were not intending to preserve something, they were actually intending to create something. And what they created stays by virtue of the treaty unless you specifically change it. So now let me look at Adil Hack's question in the Q&A. Um, I'm just reading it now. So he says, suppose we're right that the content of the right um, of self-defense under the charter is determined by customary international law. How would the persistent objector rule apply? Could we end up in a situation in which state A may use force against non-state actors in B, but not in C? Okay, so basically Adil is asking, as I understand it, that let's assume that it's possible to change the rule under custom could you have a persistent objector position where, uh, whereby, in effect, the state's obligations are different as between its relations to one state and its relations to another state because that other state is a persistent objector? So what I would say, Adil, is that whatever the answer to that question, um, ah, okay, I think I see what you're saying. So you're saying that if under the law of self-defense, there's a persistent objector, does the persistent objector position get built into the charter under Article 51? I think that's the point that you are, that's the point that you're making. Okay, so that is a good, a good question, which I hadn't previously thought of. So it does make sense. So if some states are persistent objectors, could they claim that because there's no customary law rights, there is therefore no Article 51 right? Good question. Um, off the top of my head, my instinct is to say yes, that that is in theory possible. That's what I would say, because then you wouldn't have that right under custom, and therefore there's nothing preserved under, under the UN Charter. So that's my instinct, but it's something I'll definitely need to, to say, uh, to, to think about a bit more. Um, and finally, I will just re reply to Max Hiller's question. Is it accurate to say that the charter rules take precedent over all other rules, customary or otherwise? I mean, I don't think they take precedence over rules of use Kogans, but I do think that they would take precedence over customary rules and over other treaties because of what I said about Article 103. Now, technically, Article 103 doesn't apply to the relationship between the charter 
and custom, it doesn't. But I cannot see how Article 103 does not influence the relationship between charter and custom. Because as I explained, Article 103 in effect says, you cannot change these rules, even if you all agreed to change them expressly by treaty, other than by amending this UN Charter. That's the effect of Article 103. It would seem to be perverse to then say, even though you couldn't do it in writing expressly by treaty, but nonetheless, you could do it by custom. It's hard for me to see how that works. So that would be my response to, uh, to Max. EJ, I think I've dealt with the questions in the in the Yeah, chat. I'm mindful of time because everyone is busy, so I'm mindful of time. Thank you very much for the next part of the comments. I'm going to say to everybody, I need one minute to remark on his paper. But start with that more. You give us your last, your closing remarks on the paper and the comments you've had so far from the panelists and the talks on it so far, as well as you're going in the same order of the panelists giving us that one minute remark. Thank you. I, I have no further remarks to, to give, just to thank the panelists for very, very thought provoking comments and, and questions, and also the ones in the QA. So thank you. Thank you. The next will be Monica, please. One well, minute, I, a minute. Yes, I, 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 I welcome the discussion. I think it's been very interesting. I, I think that Tom's uh, suggestion that uh, um, other uh, you know, practitioners, uh, publicists from all regions and then states also from other regions, uh, the reviews are extremely important. And I think that this is, this is a very key uh, point to, to remember. And, and NAS, um, a contribution, I think uh, she she is, is very welcome. I think that uh, these rules, I think, are extremely important for the per preservation of humanity <laughs> in its entirety. Uh, as technology develops, I think uh, we should keep that in, in mind and, 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 and have the relevance of the charter. So I, I welcome the position um, of Professor Dapos uh, on, on the importance of, of, of the charter uh, from that perspective. Thank you. Thanks a lot, thank you. Professor Mohammed, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, EJ. I, I really don't have much to add except you know to thank Dapo. Um, I, I would just say that I, I I don't know if I'm entirely convinced that intervention by invitation is not an exception to the use of force uh, prohibition, but you know that's maybe a conversation for later. Um, and just I, I thank you for this piece that just invites us to think about these fundamental theoretical questions in international law, such as the relationship between treaty and custom. Um, there are such fundamental questions that do not get as much as attention as they should. Um, so thank you for your piece and thank you um, to Tom, Monica and Nas for, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mohammed. Professor Nas, please. Thanks so much. Just reiterating uh, what's already been said and, and uh, reiterating what uh, I think all of us have said, which is that hopefully this is the, the activity in this area, particularly in the last um, year or two, I hope is an invitation and a, a provocation to not only scholars, but also states to become uh, more vocal, more engaged uh, in this area. Thanks so much, uh, Dapo, and thanks so much to ASIL. Thank you, thank you. Tom, please. Apologies, it should be better. Okay, yeah. thank you. And um, many thanks to Dapo for responding to the various comments, uh, which cannot have been an easy job, of course. Uh, I'm sure that we can continue for a few more rounds. Uh, and I'm sure, not sure if the audience is, uh, uh, has, has other plans for today. Maybe one last point, uh, and I'll be uh, very brief. Um, I, uh, Dapo, um, you, you need um, understood how I saw these mitigating factors, and you rightly point out that the problem still remains that subsequent practice requires the agreement of all the parts to the treaty under Article 31 as a primary instrument of interpretation. Uh, I would simply, uh, just to give you, uh, to, to provoke you a bit more, uh, again, draw attention to Article 32, which envisages the use of subsequent practice as a subsidiary means of interpretation. And hypothetically, hypothetically, at least one might argue that a reading of the prohibition of use of force that does not allow states to intervene to prevent human catastrophes would be an absurd interpretation of the treaty, so that Article 32 of the Vienna Convention of Law of Treaties could step in. In which case, 
hypothetically, you could use subsequent practice without necessarily reflecting the intention of the common will of all the parts of the treaty. But I think we could take this a few more rounds, uh, but I'm more than satisfied with all the uh, answers, the uh, rich answers that have been uh, made by the chief speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. At this point, I'll say thank you very much to all the panelists and our lead speaker, Professor Dabbo. It's been an informative session. We could go on and on, but everyone is mindful of time. Now I've got a meeting to jump into. So at this point, I say a very big thank you to everyone for honoring African Interest Group's invitation. We say thank you very much. On behalf of Mohammed and I, we say thank you very much, Dabbo, for coming around. Thank you, Naz, for coming around. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Everyone for coming around, we do appreciate it. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.